I'm not worried about blackouts, but I'm worried about uh, the competitiveness of certain sectors that are really dependent on energy prices. Our current view is that it will not begin to get better until at least into the middle part of next year, uh, and it's still very fluid. We think demand um, is recovering, um, but there's been a paradigm shift to online. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. China's nightmare Evergrande scenario in, is an uncontrolled crash, while Beijing faces pressure to intervene amid signs of contagion. UK retail sales fall unexpectedly for the fourth month in a row. This is the worst stretch for British shops since the mid-90s. And we speak to the chief executive of the world's first venture capital fund that prioritizes underrepresented entrepreneurs. Eric Collins from ImpactX joins us later in the program. Please send us your questions on IB Plus TV Go or on Twitter. First thing is first, so let's check on the markets. Now, we did see a sell-off over the last four to five days. Yesterday, it wasn't too bad, so we finished off uh, the day in the green for a lot of these stocks in the U.S. And today, look, we're getting a nice little lift at 0.6%. I need to warn you, it is triple witching. Now, this comes around, of course, every quarter. It usually triggers volatility, so just watch out for any kind of unwarranted volatility or sometimes the markets, especially around 1, 2 p.m. London time are a little bit funnier than usual. Iron ore, this is a big one. 102, if it touches 100, uh, could actually spur a little bit of movement on commodities overall. This is part of the China story, so we'll look at Evergrande and overall some of the cyclical stories that we've seen out there. Right, let's look at the individual maps when you look at the UK, the FTSE, the CAC, and all of that, because it gives us usually a good picture of what exactly is moving the markets, retail and travel companies leading some of the gains in Europe, you can see the CAC 40, 1.1% higher. Again, the, we'll spend a bit of time talking about that submarine deal. The DAX over in Italy, the MIB and the UK, uh, probably gaining as much as 0.4, 0.5%. So there are see, uh, very similar patterns. The economy, still one of the biggest concerns. And then, of course, we have that retail data out of the UK that could hurt in the longer term some of the retailers that are in the FTSE. Not so. Retail today gaining 1.5% amongst the biggest gainers. So is travel and leisure and technology. Look, there's one lonely, lonely, lonely commodities group that's actually down with basic resources, down some 1.3%. Now let's get straight to our top stories, Mark, market story, and it's probably commodities with MLive's Eddie van der Veld. So Eddie, I know you're looking at energy prices. We're looking at iron ore prices. What are we expecting from them? Yeah, look, um, energy prices and uh, just commodities in general have been really in focus over the last uh, few months, really. Those energy prices in Europe, they have really rallied. And there's a, a whole confluence of factors that are driving them, them higher from, you know, hurricanes in the U.S. to low wind speeds in Europe. But really, uh, you know, there is a, there is whenever a, a commodity goes parabolic, like we're seeing here, there is a risk of a significant pullback. And at the moment, what we're seeing is demand destruction in uh, energy in the energy market. In iron ore, on the other hand, we are seeing China um, trying to pull back some of its more polluting industries, and that's uh, that's that's limiting steel demand, which is limiting the demand for iron ore. So, so two very different stories. Um, but but it just shows that in this commodity super cycle, you really want to back the right horses. You certainly do. Now, iron ore, right, close to falling below $100. What happens at $100? So we could see, I mean, look, we could see a bit of a, 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 a further pullback. Um, the miners in particular have done really well on higher um iron ore prices, the producers of steel, that they are looking for lower prices. There could be some follow through selling at, at $100, um, but, but these are very fundamentally driven markets. I wouldn't put too much weight on the technicals. Eddie, thanks so much. I'm live's Eddie van der Velt there with the very latest on the markets. Now, Beijing is facing increasing pressure to intervene amid signs of increasing Evergrande contagion risks. This is as a crisis facing the company is actually fueling concerns over the nation's real estate and credit marks. Well, the PBOC has injected $13.9 billion of short-term cash into the financial system to soothe market nerves. Joining us now is Bloomberg's China credit reporter, Rebecca Chung Wilkins. Rebecca, thank you for joining us. I mean, could this be China's Lehman moment? 
Well, that's certainly what folks are trying to examine here. I think the kind of critical difference is that, of course, Evergrande is a property firm. It does have a significant chunk of um, kind of assets behind it. And on the other hand, um, Chinese authorities do have quite a bit of room here to move. And in terms of move to save the firm, to kind of uh, negotiate a potential smooth way out. And of course, their priority will be to cut down on any chance of triggering systemic risk across the broader financial financial markets. So, Rebecca, what does it, I mean, the Chinese authorities, I imagine now, are looking at worst case scenario and best case scenario. Like, what's being said in the corridors of power? Well, I think you know, the whole dilemma here for uh, Chinese authorities is around moral hazard. So Chinese authorities have moved very quickly this year to kind of clamp down and to introduce a more market-led approach to risk by allowing things like a record number of defaults um, and, of course, that very protracted uh, resolution at Huarong earlier this year. Um, I think the worst-case scenario would be somewhere where we saw the kind of social unrest element still spreading across uh, broader, the broader nation um, and of course like some of the, those smaller banks really being roiled because of their exposure to uh, Evergrande and the difficulty for those smaller banks to kind of take a hit. Rebecca, thank you so much. Rebecca Chung Wilkins there with the very latest on some of these things that we're watching in Chinese markets and, of course, the impact it could have across the board on systemic risks. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the program, we speak to the chief executive of the world's first venture capital fund that prioritizes underrepresented entrepreneurs. Well, Eric Collins from ImpactX joins us this hour. You can send your questions on IB plus TV Go or just tweet me. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, to get to, let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. Italy is to require all workers to have a valid COVID passport, the toughest vaccination requirements in Europe. The so-called green pass showing vaccination, past infection or a recent negative test marks a victory for Prime Minister Mario Draghi in the face of opposition from right-wing parties. From October 15th, staff and companies face fines of as much as €1,500 for non-compliance. IMF chief Kristalina Gorgieva says she fundamentally disagrees with the finding of a report that she had applied pressure on World Bank staff to boost China's ranking in an economic report when she worked there. She's accused of putting undue pressure on bank staff to adjust China's rating in the Doing Business report when she was chief executive. The report became so controversial that the World Bank announced it will stop producing it. Beijing has applied to join an Asia-Pacific trade pact once heralded by the US as a way to isolate China in the region. China made a formal application to join the CPTPP on Thursday. The US pulled out of the deal in 2017 under President Trump. The UK has also signaled it wishes to join the pact. New members need the agreement of all 11 existing nations. President Joe Biden's vaccine booster plan faces the first of two crucial tests today when FDA advisers meet to discuss them. The White House would like to begin offering boosters to almost all vaccinated adults starting next week. But some health experts caution the administration is rushing ahead without enough data and regulatory oversight. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Francine. Laura, thanks so much. Now, with contagion risks from the Evergrande crisis and concern over growth in China, investors are becoming increasingly wary about the world's second largest economy. Our next guest says now is the time, is not the time to be adding exposure to China. Well, let's welcome uh, Janet Moy. Uh, she is, of course, investment director at Bruin Dolphin. Janet, we're lucky to have you, especially on a day like today, where we really try and understand the consequences of what's happening with Evergrande. Is this the Lehman Brothers moment for China? Good morning, Francine. Thanks for having me. Well, I don't think this is um, going to be a Lehman moment for China. Uh, this is just one individual company. And of course, there is a concern of the spillover impact for the industry. But I think if this 
uh, is managed uh, well, I think it should avoid a widespread um, uh, a threat to the sentiment in the Chinese market. And I do think that the Chinese authorities understand the implication of a widespread systemic impact. So I think this uh, Evergrande issue will be handled very sensitively. Um, so I, I doubt that this will be as systematic as the Lehman moment. And obviously, this is more of a you know, domestic story for China, and I doubt that it will be um, contagious to the global economy. So what does that tell us, Janet, about some of the you know, choices that PBOC and other Chinese authorities have to make? Do they need to actually start intervening? I don't know what worst case scenario is, but we are seeing more signs of contagion because of Evergrande. Yeah, um, primarily it is within the property sector. So um, the Chinese authorities, uh, they would like to slow down the property sector. So I, I think that um, it, it is very hard to say. I mean, historically, investors have been assuming that Chinese government will just bail um, these, these companies out. But I think no longer that will be the case. No longer you can uh, implicitly assume that um, the Chinese government will bail them out. So I think this issue will be confined within the property sector, uh, which is... Um, you know, as investors are already kind of assuming a slowdown. And I think the Chinese government will try to avoid that being spilled over to the other parts of the economy. Um, so I think that the authorities will uh, try to make it clear and try to provide the less necessary liquidity in, in such an event in case the market uh, are starting to see some spillover. So I, I think that the risk should be relatively contained. But of course, it is still uh, pretty much up in the air because it is still not clear what the Chinese authorities are going to do about yeah. it. So, uh, Janet, what does this all mean for investors? Like, what, you know, what should I do if I have exposure to China right now? Yeah, so I think that the uh, implication is that you have to be very cautious in investing in China. There are just so many issues at the moment, um, and we should expect continued near-term volatility. Well, we, we, ju we just don't have this uncertainty on the Evergrande situation. Um, and we also have the uncertainty on the regulatory crackdown. It doesn't seem to end. And there's also this slowdown concern in China. So I think all these adding up together, you, you, you've got to be uh, pretty cautious uh, in your investment strategy in China. A cautious, Janet, in terms of just trying to figure out what happens next in terms of crackdown or regulation? Or actually, maybe even possibly, you know, pulling some money out in the sideline until we under we have a clearer picture of what's going on. Yes, I think uh, a lot of the debate is whether you should, you know, sell out of China or you should add more at this stage. Um, I think either decision is very difficult uh, because, I mean, overall speaking, China is still a very, very dominant player in the world economy and is expected to grow. Uh, uh, very, very well in the next decade or so, driven by the domestic consumer story. So it's unclear whether you, you should you know, let go of all of these potential opportunities in the long term, if you're a long-term investor, right? So another, cons another consideration, whether you should be adding positions at these kind of valuations. And it, again, it, it is very difficult because historically you would, have, you would expect to have a pretty good return if you buy these valuations. But I think you have to add a bit more consideration in the risk implications. So we're still not sure whether these valuations are attractive enough for people to buy in into the market. So I think, you know, if you're holding on to your China position, um, it is a very tricky to whether you decide to sell out or you add. So I think the right um, decision potentially is to just hold and see how it goes before you make that important decision. Um, Janet, what do you, I mean, th there's, you know, the other big story, of course, is iron ore. What do you do with commodity rich stocks right now or that industry group? Yeah, so um, commodities, we think that it's probably had its peak moment, uh, basically because we, we had a, a very strong rally in a lot of the industrial commodity prices, primarily because of the resurgence in demand in the global economy, first driven by China and then uh, the rest of the world. But now the China bid is definitely waning, in particular in the property sector. That is a, a very important demand. And also, we, we think that according to the indicators that we're seeing, um, uh, growth is slowing at the moment. So I think a lot of that catalyst... I 
think we've just had a video problem, actually. Sometimes these things happen. It's very 2021. But actually, next time, we'll also try and get Janet here in the studio to talk more about commodities. She was making some very interesting points on how the Chinese uh, authorities and governments are now looking at some of the risks out there. Um, I don't know if Janet's back. Uh, we may go to Janet Moix. Yes, I'm back. I'm back. Janet, you've just, yeah, you were Sorry. just cut off and you were, you know, giving us your latest thoughts on iron ore. Um, in 20 seconds, is now the time to just sit on the sidelines? Yeah, we feel, we feel that the commodity uh, complex it has probably seen its strongest catalyst uh, a couple of months before, uh, ago, and we don't think that it's going to be repeated in the next couple of months. So I, I feel that um, the, the value, the cyclical areas of the stock market is likely to, to underperform the growth areas of the market. Janet, thank you so much. Janet Moy there, Investment Director at Bruin Dolphin, also navigating some of these technical issues with great aplomb. Now, coming up, the rise of the influencers, where those on social media platforms such as TikTok offer a variety of advice on insights on personal finance. We talk about the finfluencers, the financial influencers. It's a really fun story. They can also earn up to $500,000. More on today's Big Take up next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Bloomberg's big take today is on so-called finfluencers. That's financial influencers. Now, these are the teens and 20-somethings who can steer online conversations about life hacks, beauty products, Hollywood blockbusters, and they're now blazing into the, their American finance. Now, the finfluencers have apparently climbed up the ranks to become some of the most sought-out content creators on the internet. Well, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Charlie Wells. Charlie, I'm obsessed with the story. <laughs> I know the readers are. Social media, they just want to know more. So basically, so I'm probably too old to be a finfluencer, but this true. is someone who's cool. All right, let's become finfluencers. And basically, you get paid by a bank. You can make up to $500,000 by doing what? Yeah, so basically, this is a confluence of two big trends. Yeah. So it is influencers, which we've, of course, seen for many years now. So people at restaurants promoting a restaurant on Instagram, at hotels promoting a, promoting a hotel, and retail trading. So the exuberance about retail trading right now. What these finfluencers do is they make sort of educational, sort of advertorial content that asset managers like Betterment or Wealthfront want to plug their products. So it's not necessarily funny. Right. Not always. I mean, it can be educational. Um, right. I think when it's both is where it really hits the sweet spot. And that's hard to do because the conventional wisdom in financial advising, of course, is that financial advice should be boring, not exciting. Uh, unless it's Bloomberg surveillance. <laughs> Ex because oh. we are so exciting. Uh, yes. uh, so this is not traditional advertising because actually we don't want to see boring depliants and, and no. boring stuff, right? It's kind of, it's the interaction. So I, I guess it's the personality also. It's very personality driven. And there are certainly some personalities in this space. So we have a woman called Mrs. Dow Jones, who's very funny, but also educational and she will say teach people about Bitcoin by comparing the asset to the relationship between Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez or Just too good. it's too good or Billie <laughs> Eilish's rise to fame to teach about compound interest. Okay. Is there a danger for big financial firms that some of the stuff is not true? Great like question. They say. But, Great. It's but it's fine. So is it meant to be lighthearted <laughs> or is it actually investment advice? Yes. Yeah, so it's, okay. this is risky because, you know, what attracts attention on social media is not necessarily good financial advice. And so there is a reputation management element here. And what was really striking when our team spoke with these big firms was that they review the scripts and they have their lawyers review these scripts to try to mitigate that risk. I mean, it's so funny. I mean, I remember, so there was someone who was talking about hedging, mm -hmm. and then, the, you know, the, the famous couples, celebrity couples that talk about NFTs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, we should do that. We, we should, should do, do that. it I think right now. Hit. We'd be do, do they bring people with them? So, you know, they're funny. They have, what, uh, you know, 100,000 followers, a million followers. But do people then sign up for these financial yes. services? That is what's really striking. And so, you know, one day Betterment saw 10,000 people sign up for a service and they were asking, what, what is this all about? <laughs> and it was coming from a Finfluencer. I mean, it's just amazing. How many people actually earn 500,000 pounds doing this? Yeah, that's is a that, few. I mean, it's a few people right now. So it's early days. And some of these early movers are making a lot. So one of the guys that we talked to in the story makes about 
$8,000 for a single post on some of these platforms. Um, but he's he's an early mover. And so, you know, as more people enter the space, that figure could go down. All right. I love that. Charlie and I work so hard on our social media accounts. We try. Also, just follow us as well, right? Please we're do. both on Instagram <laughs> and we're both on Twitter. She's better than I am. Tra not really. Charlie Wells. We'll give some content for TikTok next. Charlie Wells uh, joining us there from a Quick Take. Now, remember, you can also read today's Big Take in full on Bloomberg.com and on NI Big Take on your Bloomberg terminal. And actually, Charlie and I will also put it on social media for you. There you go, on Instagram. Smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Later on in the program, we also speak to the chief executive of the world's first venture capital fund that prioritizes underrepresented entrepreneurs. Uh, Eric Collins from Impact X joins us this hour. Send your questions to him. We're going to talk about biases. We're going to talk about some of the wonderful things that they've been supporting, including Marshmallow, one of the first, uh, actually, unicorns here in the UK in that space. So you can IB plus TV go. You can also use Twitter. And we're also on Instagram. So we're reachable in many different ways. This is Bloomberg. Now, China's nightmare Evergrande scenario is an uncontrolled crash. Beijing faces pressure to intervene amid signs of contagion. UK retail sales fall unexpectedly for the fourth month in a row. This is the worst stretch for British shops since the mid-90s. And we speak to the chief executive of the world's first venture capital fund that prioritizes underrepresented entrepreneurs. Eric Collins from ImpactX joins us later in the program. Send your questions on IB Plus TV. Go. Now, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I feel like we've just about made it to Friday. It's been a long week for everyone, especially those on the markets. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, there's a little over a week to go until Germany heads to the polls, and leading candidates Olaf Scholz and Armin Laschet are intensifying their campaigns. Now, the latest polling shows the CDU is finally closing the gap with the main rivals, the SPD. Our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, is here with the very latest. Maria, I feel like the race is so open because of the margin of errors. I mean, what will be the deciding factor in the end? Yes, and Francine, you make a great point. And every time I speak to a pollster in Germany, they say this, the margin of error is very key in an election like this. Five points, four points, an election when everyone polls 25 to 18 on that range can really change everything. And then we had this poll today, the CDU polling 22 percent. This is the best they've had in a month. It does seem that it is narrowing that gap, but that could really change things. In terms of the deciding factor, it's very hard to see a single issue in the election. We know that the economy is big. We know that climate is big. We also know that personalities in this one are actually playing a big role. But to me, I spoke to someone from the CDU this morning, and he said, in the end, we could still win it because Germany is not Berlin. It's not hipster. It's not cool. This is still a conservative country. It's still a Christian country, and we really like cars. So I, I thought everyone was a hipster nowadays. I'm so shocked. That's the real breaking news this morning on Bloomberg TV. Um, talk to me a little bit about coalitions, right? So how difficult, if we don't really know or, or believe the polls but not 100% trust them because of the margin of error, then we're going to build coalitions, which is going to be mind-blowing. Anything could happen, almost. What's priced in the market? Yes, and two parties is a mess. Can you imagine if you have to bring in three that really go all the way in the political spectrum? Then, from, it's even more. then it's even more of a mess, exactly. And that's what everyone tells me in, in Germany. This is not just about the election, which is wide open, but also the coalitions after. And it's September 27, when we're really going to see that this is going to be very, very difficult for the next chancellor to keep everyone in check. The flip side, however, However, a lot of people tell me, you know, we're not going to see that radical change because ultimately when you have to bring in so many different factions together, it's all about the compromise. Mm -hmm. So perhaps some of the most uh, kind of out there proposals from the Greens, but also the Liberals, maybe the CDU, they could still try to form a coalition. That's also I'm always reminded of. It's happened in German history. Even if they don't win, they could still try to form one because they're so tight and everyone is polling very similarly. So it's a coalition that will be a big, big mess. I'm told the talks will only get serious by Christmas, and we're lucky if by the start of next year, around February, we have a government. All right, we're going to talk a lot about Germany then. Maria, thank you so much, Maria Tadeo, there here in London for us. Now, for more on the upcoming election, you can also watch our special program, 
it was a success. Germany decides the chief executive briefing you can find it on Bloomberg.com and on YouTube. Now we speak to some of Germany's highest profile business leaders, including the chief executive of Deutsche Bank for a whole hour. Now let's get a check on how the markets are shaping up with Bloomberg's Ritika Gupta. Ritika, so what are you watching today? Yeah, Francine, seems over here in Europe, it's another day of gains. We're up some 0.5% on the stock 600. Over in the U.S., pretty much flat, just tilting to the downside. Yesterday, we struggled to hold on to some of those gains, despite a positive CPI print there. But let's brace ourselves for a bit more volatility today, because it is quadruple riching. That is the expiration of futures and options taking place. And then I point to our 10-year yield sitting at 1.33%. And of course, Francine, i don't got to talk about iron ore. No respite for him again, down in that that Singapore session, some 4.6 percent there, really hitting our miners over here. Yeah, so let's focus also uh, on the UK and the missing retail sales. What is this telling us about the UK consumer? Yeah, Francine, a downward surprise here for retail sales in the UK for the month of August, down some 0.9 percent. The expectation was that we would be up 0.5 percent. This really was meant to be the UK <coughs> consumer coming back, getting out there, spending, spending back to school, back to work. But really, it feels like the coronavirus is still dampening demand. Four straight months here of declines and really falling across the major categories, too. But I will point out one thing which is important is that it doesn't include uh, restaurants. And so it could be that it's a kind of a shift in consumer pressure. References, less spending on clothes and more spending on going out and having a good time. But Francine, it's important and interesting to compare it to the U.S., where we saw really it was that consumer driving those retail sales higher again. This idea of back to school, back to work, something that's not really taking place over here in the U.K. It would seem, Francine. Ritika, thanks so much, Ritika Gupta. There with the very latest on the markets in the U.K. Now, smart conversations continue right here on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we speak to the chief executive of one of the world's first venture capital funds that prioritize underrepresented entrepreneurs where Eric Collins from Impact X joins us this hour. Send your questions on IB plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. That's the promise presidential candidate Joe Biden made to voters over a year ago. It's time to reverse the priorities in this country. It's time to help small businesses. When the federal government spends taxpayers' money, we should use it to buy American products and support American jobs. And that's the plan President Joe Biden laid out to Congress starting last March. But from the beginning, he insisted he would not just borrow to get it done, that we had to figure out how to pay for it. The investments I'm proposing will be fully paid for over the long term by having the largest corporations, including the 55 corporations that paid zero federal tax last year, and the super wealthy began to pay their fair share. And this week, we got some specifics on just what it will take to pay for what the president wants. It may not be as dramatic as the fashion statement made by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez at the Met Gala this week, but it still would be the most sweeping set of tax increases in nearly 30 years, including raising the top rate on personal taxes, increasing taxes on capital gains, and imposing a 3% surcharge on anyone making more than $5 million a year. And it's not just individuals who'd get hit. The top corporate rate would go up to 26.5%. There'd be new levies on overseas corporate income. And the carried interest break so beloved by private equity would get cut back further, applying only if you hold the asset for at least five years before you sell it. Not surprisingly, Democrats and Republicans see these proposals very differently, with President Biden's chief economist claiming the corporate tax changes would bring more investment onshore. The core values the president has put forward is reverse the most negative impact of the Trump tax cuts and get this corporate tax reform right so that we are encouraging more incentives to invest here domestically. While Republicans warn these hikes would make American industry less competitive. They'll be crippling for Main Street businesses. Certainly they'll land on working families, but as importantly, we're gonna drive U.S. jobs overseas. Uh, and, and this is trying to fight our way out of the pandemic. It is the biggest economic blunder I've ever seen a country make. 
It's a fundamental clash of wills and of philosophies. But with a Democratic majority in both houses, it looks like we're in for a change. The question is, how big will it be? So as you were just hearing U.S. politics on this edition of Wall Street Week, David Weston wraps up the week in the markets, the most recent U.S. inflation data, and of course a tax proposal released by House Democrats this week. Now let's get to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. As consolidation heats up in the American financial industry, Bloomberg understands the Japanese lender is exploring options for MUFG Union Bank, which has about 300 branches and more than $16 billion in equity capital. South Korean shipbuilder Hyundai Heavy jumped on the first day of trade in Seoul. That's after raising almost $1 billion in the nation's fifth biggest offering this year. Shares rose by as much as 125%. The shipbuilder plans to use the proceeds to fund eco-friendly vessels. Controversial British journalist Piers Morgan has signed a series of deals with Rupert Murdoch's media empire. News Corporation's News UK says Morgan will have a TV show airing in the UK, the US and Australia, plus two weekly columns for the New York Post and the UK's Sun newspaper. The TV show, to be filmed in London and airing in early 2022, will be broadcast on a new UK television channel. Francine, Tom McKenzie is still making up his mind about whether he'll be tuning in. What about you? Like you don't know. Thank you so much, Laura. Right. Now, my next guest is the chief executive of ImpactX Capital Partners, a venture capital company supporting underrepresented entrepreneurs across Europe. Now, his latest investment is into digital insurer Marshmallow, which is one of the UK's first black unicorns. Now, let's discuss why investing in diverse businesses will actually help bring outsized returns. Eric Collins, great to have you on the program. We've, you know, caught up a couple of times and we've been following your journey. We started off with a first interview, I think, two years ago, and the numbers were horrific in terms of how much capital goes to BAME you know, founders. Has it changed? Has it gotten better? Certainly, Francine. First of all, thank you for letting me be with you today and talk about this issue. The, what we found is that there are lots of lip service has gone to making investments yeah. in underrepresented entrepreneurs. And underrepresented might be women who receive very little funding and then people of color who receive very little funding. That's around the world. In the UK, uh, that is uh, particularly difficult. When we look at the numbers, the numbers are less than 2.9% of funding goes to women-led um, ventures and less than 0.2% goes to black-led ventures. So there's a lot of opportunity for upside in terms of investing more. What we have noted in terms of this particular investment that you and I are talking about today in this unicorn called Marshmallow, which has certainly bucked the trends, not only have they raised money, but if you think about it, they've raised $85 million, and they are now valued at $1.25 billion. $85 million represents the all the uh, investment that has ever been made in a black company in the UK over the last 10 years. I mean, that's crazy. That is crazy. Okay, so you have Marshmallow, mm -hmm. and suddenly people know about the company, yes. they know what they do. D does it mean that actually you're going to get more support for those kind of funds? That's the intention, right? You try and prove, anyone who's in an investing position wants to prove a track record, and that track record should then lead to more um, capital coming in so that you can manage more people's money. The challenge that we sometimes find is that people don't necessarily believe the numbers. The data is there, but the question of how people interpret that data, oh, Marshmallow might be viewed as just a fluke, or it might be viewed that ImpactX was just lucky to find them and they caught onto a bandwagon that someone else had started. Um, but in this situation, I think that this is the beginning of a trend. And if you look at the last month, there have been two black, mar there have been two black unicorns. So not only World Remit, uh, but then also Marshmallow. So in the course of two months, we're beginning to see that the markets are looking a little different, possibly. Okay, so what did you see in Marshmallow? We saw in Marshmallow, we actually did a lot of study before we chose Marshmallow. We looked at hundreds of companies that were in the insure tech space, and we then also looked at about 25 that we sort of dug into in a diligence fashion. What we saw about Marshmallow is we saw some young people who had actually identified a market problem that was a growth area. Insure, insure tech is a growth area anyway. The insurance is a pretty sort of antiquated in terms of the systems and the approaches. You and I both know this as people who insure homes, cars, et cetera. 
And so there's reason for disruption. So we looked at that. And then beyond that, we looked at these are places where people of color and women spend a good deal of time. They've been in the insurance industry, whether they be brokers or whether they be actuaries or whether they be risk managers. They do all sorts of things. So there's deep industry knowledge. We decided that based on that, it made perfect sense to try and find the organizations that were disrupting what was going on, and we had the talent to be able to make sure that we could go forward with some interesting companies. But Marshmallow stood out because the two young men, the three young men, actually David, Oliver, and Alexander, had worked together before in a startup, and they had actually done some interesting things there, and they had come up with an interesting proposition. Eric, I also want to talk a little bit about what some of the big companies are doing. So Netflix moved $100 million to black-owned banks. Google said mm -hmm. it would also direct $100 million uh, to black-led funds and companies. And SoftBank is hiring Stacey Brown, Phil Potts, former chief executive of TaskRabbit to help run its new $100 million fund. Do you, these things help? So they're big companies. It, it's actually like a, a drop in the ocean of what they're doing. But does it get more investors aware of what's going on and, and maybe some of the companies that they could invest in? Certainly it helps, Francine, but I think you said the right thing. It's a drop in the ocean. What is it? $69 trillion in just the U.S. are um, being held by asset managers. And if we look at those numbers, hundreds of millions versus trillions, that's a big delta between those two. And if we look again at just the numbers that are associated here in the UK, although we've had some of the biggest years these last two years in investing, we still find there were only 38 black entrepreneurs who raised money from venture capitalists. So although there is momentum, that momentum, should, I would expect a torrent. I would expect people to be biting my hand off because of Marshmallow yeah. and because of now it's Zez, but, um, you know, World Remit. Is there a, um, you know, at what point is it very difficult to get mm -hmm. access to funds? Is that at all levels or is it, you know, more difficult at, at seeds at the start? For an entrepreneur, I think it's very challenging to, when you come up with a new idea, to get people to listen right. and to get people to believe that something's happened. Once you have a bit of traction, mm -hmm. then things happen. I think if you look at Marshmallow as an example and you look at their cap table, so who has invested, okay. you'll notice you don't see any of the big names. So think of the biggest names that you think of in venture who are very interested in being involved in every deal. They want to be known as the people who've discovered everything from Spotify to Amazon. None of them are part of this. So the question of do we find that there's a torrent of inbound activity inquiry, hopefully it's coming. Yeah. It's not there right now. And if you think about the stage, Impact X, we, we deal with relatively early stage and growth stage. We find raising money from asset allocators, the insurance companies, the pension funds, the foundations, the endowments, mm -hmm. we find all of those interesting conversations. Everyone wants to wait for someone else to move and everyone wants to wait a little bit later. More proof, more proof, more proof. So we're constantly having to prove ourselves, and still we're waiting sometimes for money to come in. Eric, what's your biggest hope for Marshmallow? So there's always a danger in actually all, uh, you know, smaller companies, entrepreneur, that they sell too quickly in Europe mm -hmm. compared to the U.S., where mm -hmm. then they grow, you know, the snowflakes of the world. If you had, you know, if Marshmallow grows, do you, do you think it could become like a, a, a big player against, you know, the bigger, like really big insurance companies? They, they have very big aspirations. The interesting thing is, if I've, reading their articles and talking to Alexander, Oliver, and David, what I've noted is that they believe that they can double down here in the UK market. And by taking the UK market, which we they only have 1% of the market right now, there's a lot of room for growth. There's 99% to go. They also believe that the approach that they're using has the opportunity to expand to other jurisdictions. But what they do think that they're going to do is eventually go public. So I think that's the aspiration to float on one of the exchanges, whether it be here or in the United States. I don't know. But they are keeping that a little close to their vest, those cards a little close to their vest. But they have intentions to actually continue operating. They feel as if they actually are sold to one of the bigger places, say Allianz or someone else, that they act, it changes something about the culture. And their intention is to make sure for underrepresented and disadvantaged people that you have insurance that's affordable. So they feel as though that might go away. Uh, has a pandemic and actually the fact that we're always on Zoom and using technology, has it been good for biases? Good for biases. Has 
That's an interesting question. I, I, you know, you would hope that because you're sitting and you're not necessarily, you know, having to pick up some coffee together and sort of spend time at your private club, that that actually breaks down some of the barriers. So to, it levels, does it level it out, though? Well, that's what we hope. What I, what I, I haven't seen a huge uptick, though, in terms of funding. I have not seen a huge uptick. I haven't seen a huge uptick in terms of the number of meetings which are held. Okay. And so that's the beginning. Um, but you would hope that all of that technology would allow us to, and all that distance would allow us to have more meetings to allow people to get more interested, to get a real sort of beginning of a relationship and then move that to something bigger. So if there's one thing that would make a big difference, what is it? You know what would make a big difference? For asset allocators to say to fund managers, I want you to invest. I want to see the returns that are coming because we know diverse teams of founders actually create a premium in terms of outcomes. They actually sell at about a 30% premium when they exit. We would like to see people following the logic and then taking that logic and saying, this is where we should be investing because we're going to get substantial returns and fulfill our fiduciary responsibility. That's what I'd like to see. And then I'd like to see fund managers actually breaking outside of their usual search images and saying that there are ways that we can find organizations just like the World Remit, just like Marshmallow, and we're going to get those sort of outsized returns because underrepresented people will, des will deliver outsized returns just like other entrepreneurs. Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. Eric Collins, the Chief Executive of ImpactX. Now, from supermodel to e-commerce, up next we also hear our conversation with Miranda Kerr, Cora Organics founder about sustainability ahead of COP26. This is Bloomberg. To continue with an economy where the overwhelming share of the benefits go to big corporations and the very wealthy, or are we going to take this moment right now to set this country on a new path? I think the infrastructure bill and the, and the bigger budget is good for the economy, but not particularly great for the stock market. I'm actually quite positive on, on U.S. growth, uh, especially in the fourth quarter. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, it's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, September 17th. Our top stories today. Discord amongst the Democrats. President Biden turns up the heat on members of his own party who are balking at his tax and spending plans. China tries to soothe nervous investors. It's injecting $14 billion of short-term cash to ease concerns about Evergrande's debt crisis. And ETFs may be Invesco's future. The active investment management firm is said to be in a merger talk with a State Street subsidiary. So we have a lot going on, a lot of concern, Kelly, of what's happening in China. And I guess authorities will have to decide whether they step in aggressively or actually see it play out. And then on top of that, we could have volatility because it's triple witching day. Happy Friday, yeah. triple witching day. Happy Friday, but beware of the witching. To your point, Francine, there are concerns still about Evergrande in Asia, but that aside, we did see a positive session in Asia overnight. Stocks really higher across the board, including in Japan, China, and Hong Kong. Even Chinese tech stocks actually rose on the day. The Hang Seng Tech Index up about 3.5%, snapping a four-day losing streak. Now, part of that is, as Francine alluded to, the PBOC injecting $14 billion of short-term liquidity into the market, really trying to ease some concern around China Evergrande, which seems to be getting closer and closer to default. Still, there is risk of contagion, and investors seem to be pricing that in, in that Chinese uh, high-yield dollar bonds have hit their lowest price since all the way back in 2012. Now, in other asset classes, I would continue to point to iron ore futures in Singapore, down for an eighth day in a row. That is the longest losing streak since January of 2016. We're getting very dangerously close to breaking through $100. And finally, the Japanese and the lone underperformer against the dollar in the G10 space today, weaker by about a quarter of 1%. Now, here in the U.S., we've seen equities struggling to gain traction really for the last two weeks, and today seems no different. Futures have been fluctuating between positive and negative territory. Right now, we're basically flat on S&P e-minis. Not a lot of movement in the bond market either. We go nowhere on the U.S. 10-year yield. We're sitting right at 133. It is a, a slightly weaker dollar today, and then I just wanted to point to crude. Of course, WTI has had quite a run. It is actually still higher for the fourth week in a row, although it is fractionally lower to end this week on this Friday, down about six-tenths of one percent, trading at $72.15 a barrel, Francine.
Kaylee, this is a picture in Europe. Now, there are a couple of stories that I want to draw your attention to. First of all, a pressure, of course, from some of the commodities, and that's filtering through, for example, some of the FTSE MIB companies. So we're still in the, in the green, gaining some 0.4%, but we're not gaining as much on the FTSE. Then, for example, we are on the FTSE MIB, which is much more skewed towards retail, much more skewed for the moment in terms of luxury, the CAC 40 also luxury rich. So the story over in the, the CAC 40, it's also this tension on submarines between the U.S., for example, and France, because the fronts uh, have been left out. I don't know whether it has an implication for trade, but it could. And then it's retail travel companies leading some of the gains. Uh, the CAC gaining some 0.5 percent. It's really only basic resources that it's the only industry group on the lower side. And we're watching iron ore as well, Kaylee. Yeah, we continue to watch iron ore. A lot of that seems to just be concern about China and lower steel production there, although that certainly is not where the China concerns stop. Now let's take a look at what else is ahead on this Friday. It is triple witching day for the U.S. markets. It's when the quarterly expiration of futures and options on indices and stocks occurs, potentially leading to higher volume and volatility. Also, Russia holding parliamentary elections with Vladimir Putin's ruling party expected to cement its control. And at 8.30 a.m., New York York time, FDA advisors will meet to discuss whether booster shots should be offered to most Americans. Obviously something the Biden administration wants to start doing on September 20th. And speaking of the Biden administration, President Biden turning up the pressure on congressional Democrats on Thursday as discord within the party threatened to derail key pieces of his economic agenda. The president spoke at the White House. For a long time, this economy has worked great for those at the very top. Uh, ordinary, hardworking Americans, the people who built this country, have been basically cut out of the deal. And I've said this from the time I announced I was going to run. I believe this is a moment of potentially great change. This is our moment to deal working people back into the economy. Anne-Marie Horder and Bloomberg Washington correspondent joins us now from our D.C. Bureau. So, Anne-Marie, September 20th is just a few days away. As we look forward to next week, what do you expect to happen? Well, next week, a lot of these bills that went from the House into the Budget Committee will be marked up in the Senate. And this pitch from the president was as much for the American people as it was for his own party. He needs to unite the Democrats in the House, whether it's the progressives and the moderates, with the Democrats in the Senate. And we saw the president and the White House aides really do that this week. He met with moderate senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema on Wednesday. Yesterday, he held a call between Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer. They said that these three will be in discussions over the next quarter. Uh, course of the next couple of weeks to make sure they can enact the president's agenda. And he outlined there why he thinks there needs to be one higher taxes, why the government should be trying to deal with um, helping prescription drug costs come down. And this was really getting at the issues that are dividing the Democratic Party right now. And we'll have to wait to see what the Senate exactly marks up from the House. Anne-Marie, good morning. So U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken also speaking at a news conference yesterday following a nuclear submarine deal with Australia and the U.K. that left France out. Um, France was furious about it. They certainly were. And Francine, here in Washington, we also have the French embassy canceling a gala that was actually going to be commemorating a crucial battle that the French were able to help in, uh, the Franco-American troops during the Revolutionary War. And the irony was not caught, uh, was, was definitely caught by the uh, embassy in Washington, D.C. So they canceled this bala, gala. You also had Macron dining with Angela Merkel last night. So it does seem to seem that Macron is trying to shore up at least German support in the Indo-Pacific. And they just seem that the French are on the back foot. They feel like they are blindsided. And they even compared this to something akin to what President Biden's predecessor, President Trump, would have done. Uh, so this is going to be very interesting because you do see the gulf really widening between Washington and Paris. Macron recently really criticizing President Biden in the majority yep. of Afghanistan. Uh, and now this is just something else that these two are um, arguing and debating about. Yeah, ooh la la for the Entente. Anne-Marie, thanks so much. <laughs> Anne-Marie Horder in there with the very latest from D.C. Now over to China, Beijing facing increasing pressure to intervene amid signs of increasing Evergrande contagion risks. Now the PBOC has injected $14 billion of short-term cash to soothe market nerves as a crisis facing Evergrande fuels concerns over the nation's real estate and credit markets. Well, Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joins us with the very latest. Tom, first of all, I mean, we don't actually know how, how big and wide this thing is if it goes under. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, the liabilities are significant. I mean, we talked about that $300 billion number in terms of the liabilities, but you've got more than a million homeowners, you've got the supply chains, you've got the rest of the property sector. We talked about the fact that those property stocks were under pressure yesterday. So you have the PBOC today, as you say, coming in with this $14 billion injection into the financial markets, the most, by the way, since February. There are some seasonal effects as well, because you're getting to the point where they're having regulatory checks. Also, the Chinese are going to be going off on holiday soon, so they draw down cash. So there's other factors, but certainly Evergrande is in the mix. And what you're getting now is that analysts and investors are starting to game out potential impacts of this if it becomes an implosion of Evergrande. Now, you have the likes of SockGen saying, look, this is not our base case, a Lehman brother moment for, for Evergrande. Their base case is, or at least they say there is a now distinct possibility that the impacts of Evergrande and the unravelling of this at least becomes a severe economic right. drag on China. RBC mm -hmm. coming out, by the way, and saying that they think this is going to have more of an impact on the economics of China than the regulatory squeeze that we've been talking about. Well, if it has an impact on Chinese economics, China is heavily weighted within emerging markets. So could the ripple mm -hmm. effects of this extend even beyond the borders of Beijing's control? Well, it absolutely could. If you look at, for example, the offshore uh, dollar bond market, which China's real estate giants dominate, and you're seeing, of course, pressure flowing into that part of the market, absolutely. And you, know, you can't look at the Asian regional economy without looking at China, of course. But in terms of what the markets are doing, the capital markets, the Shanghai Comp is actually taking this in its stride so far. In fact, it's about 3% off uh, six-year highs. The yuan is relatively stable as well. So again, investors kind of testing uh, how far uh, the CCP is prepared to go with this. In terms of the equity markets, in terms of the yuan, relative stability at least at this point. But that is banking on the consensus coming through in terms of a managed restructuring of this business. You only need to look back to 2015, of course, to see how the Chinese bungled the bailout of the markets to see that it doesn't always come good. But this is one to continue yeah. to watch, of course. Yeah, there seems to be new developments every single day. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's mm -hmm. Tom McKenzie. Now, Invesco is in talks with State Street's asset management arm about a possible merger that would create an ETF giant. This is according to a Wall Street Journal report. And let's get more on this with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny, tell us why this would be such a big deal. A big deal, Kaylee, because it would create an ETF in passive management behemoth. We don't know exactly what the terms of this deal would look like, but we do know that the resulting tie-up would just be a massive company. And this really speaks to the ETF landscape, that in order to do well here, you need economies of scale. You need enough AUM under your belt that you can charge low fees because competition means that you can't charge too much. People are just going to go somewhere else. So $1.5 trillion is managed by Invesco, uh, an additional four uh, trillion by State Street. So together they would have 20% of the ETF market share. Now that is huge, but it's still number three. Vanguard and BlackRock both have more, but this allows State Street to catch up to them and really cement their place as third. Danny, does a combined firm make sense? Are they, are they actually complementary to each other? It absolutely does because they're both in the passive management business, but the types of things they bring to the table are different enough that it gives uh, a wider portfolio of offerings. Invesco, for example, they're well known for a lot of smart beta strategies. So these are quant-like assets that are packaged up into a passive fund. State Street, their offerings, they trade a lot. Uh, traders love them because of, of the ease easiness to get in and out of these. You think of something like SBY, the S&P 500 ETF, which is the most traded. And of course, uh, Invesco has the Qs, the NASDAQ 100 fund. So two really brand name ETFs that are now going to be under the same roof, Kaylee. All right. Well, we'll wait and see if a deal does indeed get finalized. Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you so much. And now let's take a quick check on some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. Your big large cap outperformer to the upside is Abcellera Biologics. It's up 15 percent. And this is after after the company confirmed that the FDA has expanded its emergency authorization of its COVID-19 antibody treatment. Another stock moving to the upside kind of in relation to a regulator is Lucid Motors. Of course, the EPA has just awarded its debut EV with the title of the longest range EV ever. That was reported a few days ago and the stock looks like it will gain for a third day on that news. It's up 5.3 percent in pre-market trading. And one more mover to the upside is a newly public company on holding the running shoe company company made its public debut earlier this week, popped 46% in its first day of trading, 7% yesterday, and it looks like the gains will continue for a third day, Francine. That stock up 3.6% before the bell.
Yeah, a good looking shoe as well, I think. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kaylee, for some of those movers. Now, coming up, Mark Hayfile, Chief Investment Officer at UBS Global Wealth Management. He'll have a thing or two to say about China and Evergrande. We'll also talk about triple witching. At the moment, dollar steady. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Francine Lacroix in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, I was just outside because of a fire alarm. I'm not sure if it was a false alarm or a very small fire. The fire department came and just left. It was very cold outside. <laughs> um, and it made me think about natural gas prices, because as the weather gets colder, of course, you're going to see more demand for electricity to heat apartments and homes. We've seen natural gas prices absolutely soar. Take a look at this chart that uh, my New York producer, Daniel Curtis, put together. For those of you listening on Bloomberg Radio, we welcome you. And I will just point out that what we're looking at is a new record for Dutch natural gas futures, a new record for North Asia liquid natural gas prices, and just soaring above anything we've seen in some time. Eddie Vandervault joins us from Bloomberg Markets Live right now to talk about this. I mean, Eddie, we're seeing ripple effects. Some factories have had to close down already. Um, this is going to eat into Absolutely. margins. Um, but it's also just a perfect storm for this commodity, and prices have nowhere to go but up. Perfect storm in all the wrong places because we've got the wind blowing in in in, in the U.S., which is affecting uh, you know LNG exports, not blowing in Europe. So we've got lower production from the windmills and so on. I love that you brought in the local on that story. All news is local, right? And really, that's the that's that is the risk here. And if you look at that chart, you see that we had this run up in Asian LNG prices at the end of last year and a spectacular crash. And this is the risk for energy prices that you see this spectacular run up and a very sharp pullback which is fairly common in commodity prices now there are some evidence that says that this could be sticky but as you say we're starting yeah. to see some demand destruction from uh, you know from 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 big manufacturers that are saying look we you know we are trying to to limit the amount of natural gas and energy that we use broadly and and i think that's one part of the story that we'll see some demand destruction and that could help cap the prices um, Eddie, if we talk about iron ore, so it's you know collapsing pretty brutally towards $100. Mm. If it touches $100, does it mean that actually it, it could go even further down? I mean, what exactly is behind it? It seems pretty you know brutal and quick. Yeah, so so the iron ore story is slightly removed from the rest of the commodity space. In iron ore, what we're seeing is that the in in, in China they are trying to cut back on its, some of its polluting industries. That limits steel production. That reduces a demand for iron ore. And iron ore is also not really part of this big uh, commodity super cycle story, the shift to electric vehicles and to, more, to a more electrified future. So therefore, iron ore price is just coming under pressure. And you know, I, this sell-off has already gone a long way. The, particularly the miners, they will be hoping for some sort of floor around here. What about some of the other industrial base metals, Eddie? So copper is the, probably the one everybody should be excited about most. I mean, look, ab across the commodities spectrum, we have seen supply chains being stretched. And when supply chains are as stretched as they are now, and you see an outage at a single mine, the knock-on implications are severe. That's also what we're seeing in energy. But, but, but for something like, for, for, to really get behind a rally like this and not being caught out by a massive pullback you have to get some pick a pick a commodity that is a long-term winner and copper is the, is absolutely crucial to that story that i was just talking about the electrified future you can't have an electric car without copper wire and over the years over two millennium we we've searched for all the copper that we're really going to find there's no big resources out there that we're going to tap in the next few years so that story is extremely bullish 
Eddie, thank you so much. Eddie van der Valt there of Bloomberg Markets Live. Now, for more analysis, some market analysis from Eddie and his team, just go to MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Coming up, we talk dollar, we talk treasuries, and of course, we talk in general about volatility. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lachman, London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news and China has applied to join the Asia Pacific Trade Agreement the U.S. once pushed as a way to isolate Beijing. While well, Donald Trump later pulled out of the deal, the Chinese have sent a formal application to New Zealand. A number of American lawmakers have expressed concern about China's effort to join. Officials in Berlin have repeatedly warned that the Kremlin to stop cyber attacks that have intensified in the run-up to the German election. Well, two officials say the activity suggests that Russian operatives are trying to disrupt or influence the vote. The German election is seen as wide open, while Moscow has repeatedly denied meddling in other people's elections. And it's the worst stretch of performances for the British retail sector in at least 25 years. Now, sales unexpectedly fell in August for the fourth month in a row, down nine-tenths of 1% from July. Now, that suggests that a resurgence of coronavirus cases and supply disruptions in the UK are actually taking a toll. And we love this story. Finance firms that have struggled to reach young and new cool customers may now have had or found a solution. Call them influencers, so financial influencers, 20-something TikTok stars who found there's big money in being a Wall Street influencer. Now, they steer online talk about finance firms instead of beauty products and Hollywood blockbusters. Well, one claims to be making half a million dollars a year and get some of his pay in company equity. I, uh, I'm obsessed with the story, actually, Kaylee. So we had the reporter that wrote the story on. I mean, you could get like 8,000 pounds just yeah. for, um, you know, it's it's not Twitter, so it's Instagram. And what I find absolutely crazy, I mean, there's one, Mrs. Dow Jones. Mm -hmm. She kind of explains, for example, inflation through the relationship of Ben Affleck and J-Lo. I mean, I... I actually enjoy watching her. Or the cost of a Birkin bag. I have followed Mrs. Dow Jones on Instagram, I think since she launched about four years ago. To this point, though, this has gotten just bigger and bigger as time goes on. Obviously, there is information that maybe can be gleaned from social media, but there also is the risk of misinformation, Matt, with a lot of these, perhaps you could call them unsophisticated investment advisors than giving out advice for free on the Internet to millions of people. Yeah, I would say very high risk of that. Um, I, I was watching one TikTok account where a couple was explaining how they make money by buying the dip and then selling when prices rise again, as if this is um, a great strategy that anyone can follow and will never yeah. fail. Um, yeah, it's a little bit right. silly, I would say. But they do make a lot of money. Yeah, but... But, I mean, with the ones that make money because banks pay them, I was told, actually, the script, even if it's funny or silly, gets checked by lawyers. Coming up, Mark Hayfley, Chief Investment Officer at UBS Global Wealth Management. We'll talk maybe influencers, finfluencers. Mark Hayfley could be one. We'll talk dollar and we'll talk inflation. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kelly Lines in New York. Matt, a lot of the focus is on gas prices. I know you have a great chart on that, and of course, iron ore today as well. Yeah, commodities are off the hook. I mean, gas prices have been insane lately. To the upside, iron ore, um, huge drop to the downside. But uh, all of this feeds into inflation in some ways or hitting margins at companies in some ways. So eventually this impacts earnings, which is, is another reason, I think a second derivative um, mm -hmm. effect that we need to be paying attention, Francine. Yeah, 100%. And Kaylee, this is kind of playing out on the markets too.
Yeah, well, to Matt's point, so far margins actually have largely held in there. Companies being able to pass on higher input costs to their customers. But now that we're kind of out of earnings season, waiting for the next one to begin, the equity market has lost a little bit of traction. At least that's the case here in the U.S. In Europe, we are looking at a positive session on the day. The stock 600 up about four tenths of one percent. Your biggest laggard within that index once again is basic resources. That goes back to the kind of the metal story uh, you two were just talking about. Here in the U.S., it's been a rough go of it for the S&P 500 over the last two weeks and right now futures are in negative territory on this Friday morning. We're down about a tenth of a percent on S&P E minis. Of course, it is triple witching day, guys. Beware options and futures on individual stocks and futures on indices expire today. So that could mean a lot more volume and a lot more volatility. Ahead of all of that, the VIX is at an 18 handle. And then finally, just in the bond market, really nothing to say here. Flat on the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield sitting right at 133. Now, as for some stocks moving in pre-market trading, I do want to check on two newly public companies, both on holding the shoe company and Dutch Bros, the coffee company, made their debuts this week and had pretty warm reception from the public markets. Uh, on holding is up 2.3 percent. Dutch Bros is off of its pre-market highs, but still in positive territory. Of course, Joby Aviation, also a company that debuted last month, it promises to make a fleet of commercial flying taxis. That stock is up 3.5%. And then Lucid Motors, of course, try, trying to make a fleet of electric cars. It got the EPA uh, giving its sedan the longest range EV ever credential. That happened earlier this week in the stock, looking to be higher for a third day on the back of that. Right now, it's up about 5.4% in pre-market trading, Matt. Yeah, that, that range record is going to continue to be broken over and over and over again as battery technology increases. Kaylee, I actually have uh, a chart that's related to the autos industry. Um, here in Europe, it is the most undervalued industry group on the uh, stock 600, according to analysts. So um, what I'm showing our viewers, and I'll walk our radio listeners um, through it. Thank you for joining us on London DAB Digital uh, radio is that the analyst projections, the analyst consensus price target for the stock 600 autos index is now 26% higher than the actual price on the day. So um, that's the most of any industry group. And it looks like it's being undervalued because of all the problems that they've had in China. You don't know which is the next shoe to drop. Um, you've got the chip shortage, which has, of course, um, hurt their ability to produce and meet demand. You've got the shift over to EVs, which is going to be incredibly expensive, is incredibly expensive, and they're having to invest billions to get there. But analysts think um, it's worth 26% more than what you're looking at today. Joining us is Mark Heffler, Chief Investment Officer at UBS Global Wealth Management. Mark, what do you think about this industry? I think it's emblematic of so many of the issues we're seeing across uh, markets, across industry groups today. Well, I, I think that uh, you're definitely onto something here. And where we're spending a lot of time is looking kind of one layer down as we move into this net zero, uh, lower carbon rush and companies that need to produce things uh, have to meet those targets. Who are the suppliers that really benefit uh, in this move? Because they're probably not getting as squeezed as some of the the end of the line uh, industrial companies might be. As you just pointed out, they're not getting the valuation. You know, um, the Bloomberg Commodity Index has just traded above 100. It's pulled back a little bit, but it's the first time we've ever seen it go that high. How do these commodity prices affect um, our outlook for inflation, for example, and margins when it comes time for earnings in just a few weeks? Well, we've had a We've had a tremendous push up uh, in these prices, and that means a push up in and in, in inflation. So, you know, for further inflation from here, I think you know we're still in the camp that largely some of some of this reopening uh, in inflation starts to starts to slow down. But yeah, commodity prices can be higher, and we're where we're seeing that too is in the, on the energy side where paradoxically a push for cleaner energy, push for net zero has meant less investment in things like coal and, and older power plants. And that's actually contributed to this short, shorter term pop in prices.
What happens, Mark, after the short term? I mean, there, there's also a lot of questions about, you know, the labeling of ESG of exactly what happens in the next three to four months. If, you know, if COP26 is a disappointment, do you actually look at it also through the financial lens? Uh, look, I think this is the most durable trend for the next 10 years because there's, it's not just a regulatory push in Asia in Europe and in the United States now. It's also a desire, as you know, from consumers, uh, you know, and companies that want to be choice employers to be on the right side of some of these issues. And so we're saying that, you know, there there is this change out there and different companies are, are responding in different ways. So there will be maybe the winners and losers change to a degree, but it is something you need to start thinking in, in when you think about your portfolio and how you construct it, it's something you need to consider now. Uh, Mark, what happens to margins as inflation rises? Well, as, as you know, that a lot of it is being uh, currently being pushed through. And if we look at last quarter, despite all the headlines that we hear about shortages and things, we had record margins for the S&P 500. So despite the fact that we're probably past the peak in GDP growth, we actually think that the strong margins and the earnings growth are going to continue and that the, the earnings estimates are still a little bit low from here. Mark, let's talk about the Fed. September 22nd maybe is going to be a little less important than we all might have thought a month ago. What is your expectation on when we actually get the Fed taper announcement? Well, you know, the, I think it's more, it's about what happens with the jobs number and if that's good and then the COVID situation, right? So those things, and, and with COVID, it's a little bit about perception, but we're still expecting that we'll have some clarity and, and probably a start to the taper before the end of the year. Uh, but keep in mind, there's there's other things in flux, flux too, such as the fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. And so we see, what we ultimately see is the Fed reacting to the entire gambit of fiscal policy, COVID, et cetera, yeah. and trying to make the taper look like paint dry. Well, Mark, I, I'm so dry. glad that you said that because Scott Minor over at Guggenheim put out a note last night saying the Fed is going to have to hold off on tapering because of the debt ceiling issue, because of all the drama around that and the potential market turmoil that could result from it. Do you think that kind of risk is properly priced in? Well, it looks like a lot of market participants uh, believe that both the Democrats and the Republicans actually see some political upside in holding those things up. So I think some of it is priced in, but as a very successful uh, hedge fund manager told me about 20 years ago, nothing's ever really priced in until it <laughs> happens. So we'll see. Mark, I wanted to ask you about this interesting Finfluencer story we have on the terminal. <laughs> I mean, it seems a little bit silly, kids on TikTok or Instagram giving financial advice, but they're making, uh, in one case, at least more than half a million dollars a year, and they're driving retail investors to trading platforms. It kind of plays into the gamification of trading, I think, in a, in a lot of ways. How do you view um, today's market environment? Well, you know, just in this uh, segment, we're talking about flying cars, TikTok, fin Finfluencers. So I view it as I'm feeling kind of old today. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but uh, look, I think that uh, one of the things that people should pay attention to is, are you invested with people who have their own skin in the game? Uh, maybe you have to do some work to figure that out. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case here. And so, you know, I think it falls more on, on the infotainment side. All right, Mark. Yeah, Kayla, you want to jump in? Well, Mark, I just wanted to ask you, we seem to have a growing chorus of caution saying we're going to get a correction by year end. Do you agree with that? Equities are an asset class with something like 15% volatility, uh, you know, a year so you can always get a correction but we think that if these trends on the improving COVID situation continue and the Fed 
continues to be as successful as it has been with its messaging, we don't need to see that kind of a correction going into the end of the year. Yeah. All right, Mark, we'll make an influencer of you yet. So we'll push this out on social media. <laughs> Mark Hayfile there, Chief Investment Finfluencer, uh, Chief Investment Officer at UBS Global Wealth Management. Coming up, there's a little over a week to go until Germany heads to the polls. Leading candidates Olaf Scholz and Armin Laschet are intensifying their campaigns. We'll get the latest next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with Eric Adams, Brooklyn Borough President and New York City Democratic mayoral nominee. That's on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Public spending um, should be obviously limited, and, and I think we really need to come of the drug which we have seen for the last one and a half years. The state should do its homework, adapt the framework conditions under which um, innovation um, and success of the economy uh, can take place. Uh, but I also think that the state should not weaken um, working um, effective fiscal rules. In order to invest into sustainability and drive the agenda to become more carbon neutral, companies also need the money to invest. And that belongs together. And we can only be competitive also here in Europe if we also transform our industries. Well, that was some of Germany's top executives on government spending and investment. For more on the upcoming election, you can watch our special program, Germany Decides Chief Executive Briefing on Bloomberg.com and on YouTube, where we speak with some of Germany's biggest and highest profile business leaders. Now joining us to talk about the election is Bloomberg's Maria today. Maria, uh, we have quite a lot of polls. The polls are fluctuating. The margins of errors are there. So is it really all to play for? Yeah, it, it's very open. And by the way, Francine, you had a great uh, special with all the CEOs. It and was I thought fun. It was great. And, and I thought it was interesting that all of them talked about green, but they also said we are not talking enough about Europe. And it's so true because in every debate, there's been no questions on foreign policy. There's been no questions on what to do in the European Union. So they're very right. And I'm sure they're going to be watching the debate on Sunday, hoping maybe they'll change that. Mm -hmm. But in you, terms of the actual you know, uh, polls, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, in terms of the polls, we see the CDU kind of catching up here, Maria, although um, you found in your reporting that um, there's going to be a, a longer video released of Armin Laschet giggling during the flood disaster that, that Germany saw. Is that, you think, going to hurt him in the polls? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good one because there's a lot of rumors circulating in Berlin that there is more on Armin Laschet giggling around the floods. If you look at the impact that had on his polling, it could be really bad. It is true that uh, everyone in Berlin that's in the political circles is waiting for this video to come out. But, you know, one of the contacts that I have at the CDU today said they feel that is done. Everyone knows it was a bad look and he laughed. He should not have done it. And now, if anything, the CDU is very exciting that they're uh, narrowing that gap. You know, what they say is ultimately polling or polls and this is still a country that's traditional that's conservative that's christian that plays into the cdu and that loves cars and that will be something that could resonate yeah. in the final days of campaign well maria to your point polls are polls and there's a margin of error to what extent can they actually be trusted and reliable well, the polls in Germany actually do have a history of being accurate, but you're very good to signal the margin of error here is very important. Every pollster that we'll speak to or that we have been speaking with in Germany says that when you poll so tight and everyone is in the range of 20, 22, 24, a margin of error of four points could really change everything. If you have a result where the SPD comes in at 24, the CDU comes in at 22, they could also decide, hey, we're equally legitimate and we also want to try to form a coalition. So that means that Germany could go either way. So the margin of error is very important in this election. So, Maria, how difficult will coalition be? 
it will be coalition building, I should say. It will be extremely difficult, Francine, and everyone in Berlin keeps going on about this, where they say this is going to take forever to happen. We are only going to see the serious talks really happen in Christmas, and if we have a government before February, that will be a very, very good news for Germany, because to put this whole spectrum together, to bring in what is potentially a three-way coalition, it's always a mess when you have two different parties. Imagine when you have to bring in three different ones that also they want to not just give out their votes, they want to play tough and get good ministries. This is also about the jobs that you get. So, you know, it's uh, whoever gets that job and becomes chancellor, he's, uh, he's in for a tough ride. Thank you so much, Maria Tadeo there with the very latest on Germany. Now, don't forget you can watch our special program, Germany Decides, the Chief Executive Briefing, on Bloomberg.com and on YouTube. This is Bloomberg. I think we may uh, still uh, see gas prices uh, a bit uh, high for the uh, next uh, days or uh, weeks to come. And the uh, most important factor here uh, would be in the short term how the uh, winter conditions will be. With a harsh winter, we may still see a, a, a push up of uh, uh, gas prices in Europe and uh, in Asia. Well, that was the IEA Executive Director Fatih Birol talking gas prices earlier on Bloomberg. Now, uh, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, joins us now getting ready for his weekend reading with a great chart. Hi, Tom. Getting ready for the weekend reading. Daniel Jurgen scheduled to join us uh, coming up here in about three, four hours. He, he, Jurgen doesn't start his day, Francine, until 8.30. Uh, <laughs> the new map was my oh. book of the year uh, last year. He's got out the paperback version. He and I are looking at China. Here's the chart that I care about on China. It's not oil at $75, Brent crude. It's GDP. It's a view, Francine, from 60,000 feet. And the benchmark is 6 to 6%, 6 the, the pink line. There's talk of real labor issues in China when they go below 6%. They clearly did with the pandemic down to a negative statistic and down to 7.9% right now. You can see uh, the basic idea of the vectors towards 6%. That's the tension for me. Tom, I'm just stuck on someone's day not starting until 8.30 a.m. That's six hours <clears throat> after mine yeah, starts, and I know yours does, too. On the China story, though, to what extent does Evergrande have the potential to exacerbate those problems you were just talking about? It just about? points out the fragility of the system. There's different partitions of their debt structure, and the question is, does the government come to the rescue, whether they do it directly or indirectly? The answer, Kelly, is they, they always do. I mean, that's part of their process, part of their system. Modern bankruptcy is actually pretty new in China. I want to remind everybody that starting your day at 830 is called civilization. <laughs> what you, you guys do is not normal. <clears throat> um, Tom, I, I'm struck, continue to be struck by the high natural gas prices, but I was looking at a chart with Eddie Vandervault and I saw LNG. This isn't the first time this year those prices have soared. They, they jumped at the beginning of 2021 and then dropped like a Led Zeppelin. We see huge swings in commodities. So how much uh, attention do we need to pay to these kind of spikes? I think the spike is there. The tangible call here is the blended commodity call, Matt. And yeah, LNG's this and NG's that, COCL and the rest on the Bloomberg uh, terminal. I would look at the great call that, you know, Jeff Curry and others had, uh, Francisco Blanche as well, of a bull market in all commodities and now breaking out. Does it sustain? I mean, do we get a commodity rally back to when Led Zeppelin was on the charts? Like how I did that? <laughs> uh, very oh, good, yeah. Tom. You could almost we're, be a tabloid writer. We're, we're trying to get the, char the, the, the commodity boom back to when Deep Purple was on the charts so we can listen to more John Lord. Yes. Perfect. I mean, we should you do a whole have show. I don't, know, I, don't think, I don't think the lady knows what Deep Purple I do. is. They don't. I do, but it doesn't fit, make me feel any younger. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg mm, Surveillance. No now, idea. this is what else Deep we're purple. watching. No, no, but she knows the markets, yeah. and Kaylee's watching quadruple witching day. I'll bring it back to something I actually know about. Yes, it is witching day, Francine. You have options and futures on indices. Or, and, and, triple, on, uh, indices. triple witching. Triple witching is technically what they call it now if you don't count futures on individual equities. But what it basically means is there's going to be a lot of volume and a lot of volatility today. Strategists at Goldman Sachs actually estimate 3.5 
$1.4 trillion of equity options expire today. $720 billion of that is expected to be the most for any September expiration ever. So it'll be interesting to see how the price action is manipulated by this today. Matt, of course, a lot of that volume and volatility could come right at the open at 9.30 a.m. and then also at the close. Yeah, but I think it's smart to point out it is now triple witching. And there's been some debate about this. Uh, single stock futures mm -hmm. no longer trade in America. Maybe in some countries, in some markets. In but some in America, countries. that's over since one Chicago shut down, I think, at the end of last year. And even when they were dealing single stock futures, nobody was trading them. So it's triple witching now, not quadruple witching. I'm Still watching witching. Uh, this weekend. <laughs> okay, I've stopped listening, witching. Matt. Triple what are you watching? <laughs> <laughs> I I'm watching Andrea Davizioso returns to MotoGP. He was um, Ducati's Italian stallion, Desmo Dovey, um, but they kicked him out last year. He's coming back to uh, the Petronas Yamaha team, and they are racing at Mizano. Today will be his first day on the Yamaha bike. Uh, because they're not allowed to test out of um, set time. So it'll be interesting to see how he does. He's racing on a team with Valentino Rossi in Italy, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be glued to the television all weekend long. Valentino, if we know one thing, is that thanks to the Draghi effect, the Italians are smashing it in all sports as well, and the Eurovision. All right, I'm watching, actually, the, Russia <laughs> holding its parliamentary <laughs> election. Now, there's a couple of things uh, that we should be watching out for. So, first of all, Russian authorities had threatened to find two companies um, that weren't actually in line with what they were hoping the app would do. Again, uh, President Vladimir Putin's United Russia Party is, is expected to win. In total, 14 parties are taking part in the vote but many candidates seen as anti-Putin are barred from running. So, you know, uh, pretty possibly predictable what we'll see on Monday, but l let's see exactly some of the dynamics in that Russian parliamentary election. And then we look also at the ECB inflation um, configurations. Now, coming up, more Bloomberg surveillance. We'll hear from Dan Jurgen of IHS Market, amongst others. This is Bloomberg.